All right. Thanks, everyone, for coming today. My name is Shaikat Hossein. We heard some uh, great talks this morning on software and hardware. So today I'll be presenting on how, to, how cochlear implants work and how to simulate aspects of their signal processing using vocoder simulations, which can be useful research tools in the field. And I'll also share some code and audio examples from a MIDI-enabled vocoder plugin I developed using Juice, which can be useful as a tool for creating music that's inspired by CI processing. So my first ADC was actually five years ago in London in 2018, and I presented a poster that year and got a diversity fellowship, which uh, Josh recommended I apply for. Shout out to Josh, aka the audio programmer. Um, this is a picture of me with my luggage, taking a picture of the ADC logo, and about to head back to the air airport straight from the conference. Uh, I wanted to be able to come back to ADC to give a talk, so I'm like incredibly thrilled to be here today. And with that, I'd like to start today by considering the cocktail party problem which simply stated has to do with how we navigate complex listening environments consisting of multiple sound sources, including different uh, talkers and background noises. And in such situations, auditory scene analysis is the term which describes the process by which we're able to parse an auditory scene into distinct sound objects, making use of different cues. And these cues can include differences in voicing and spatial cues for different sound sources. So for people with normal hearing, this task is quite natural and it comes without much effort. However, for individuals with, with hearing loss, the situation is substantially more, more difficult. For mild to moderate hearing loss, typically a hearing aid can provide sufficient amplification to restore audibility. However, for moderate to severe hearing loss, a different approach must be considered. And the most common approach in this case comes in the form of the cochlear implant. So cochlear implant devices have been around for over 50 years now. And instead of amplifying sound like hearing aids, cochlear implants bypass acoustic transduction and stimulate the auditory nerve directly. So for those of you who are unfam unfamiliar with how cochlear implants work, sound is first captured by the microphones, which are positioned on the behind the ear unit or BTE sound processor, as it's commonly referred to. The sound is digitized and passed through various noise reduction stages, including beamforming, before it's transmitted as an FM, FM radio signal by the transmitter to the internal implant which receives the signal through electromagnetic induction and then generates a sequence of biphasic electrical pulses, which are sent to the corresponding electrodes along the cochlea. And um, cochlear implants make use of an elegant aspect of the architecture of the auditory system, where pitch is encoded in duplex, both in terms of the place of stimulation along the cochlea and in terms of the rate of firing of auditory neurons. So the cochlea is arranged like a piano, where the frequencies of the auditory neurons are arranged spatially, if a given electrode is stimulated near the base at the entrance of the cochlea, it elicits a high frequency pitch percept, which progressively lowers in pitch as we move towards the apex. And this is referred to as tonotopy, very simply uh, describing this type of frequency to place mapping. The Greenwood function is a function based on psychophysical research, which has mapped the relationship between pure sinusoidal tones and the position of the hair cells that they excite along the, the length of the cochlea. So this function, which is specific to humans, relates millimeters along the cochlea, the variable x in this equation, um, to specific characteristic frequencies. And so it's commonly used as a guide in surgical procedures to ensure that the electrode array is inserted deeply enough into the cochlea, uh, because aligning the, the electrode array to the so that the intended frequencies are being delivered to the correct locations is critical to successful outcomes for cochlear implant users. In addition to coding pitch by the place of stimulation, pitch can also be coded by the stimulation rate in a cochlear implant. So if we were to look at a, a given electrode channel, we could present a low frequency pulse train and a high frequency pulse train, where the high frequency pulse train would be perceived as being higher in pitch. So now let's let's take a deeper dive into the signal processing that's implemented in the CI sound processor. After sound is captured by the microphones on the sound processor, it's split up into a fixed number of frequency bands. The envelopes of each of these bands are extracted and used to modulate the pulses, which are then delivered along the, the electrode array. And this kind of processing is equivalent to a channel vocoder. And this is why vocoders are commonly used for CI simulations. It's important to mention that a high rate carrier signal, usually around 1,000 pulses per second, is typically used. And the carrier signal has no relationship to the incoming sound signal. It serves merely as a way of sampling the envelope modulations with high fidelity. And during the envelope extraction stage, the fine structure information within each frequency band is discarded. And this has negative consequences to speech and noise and music perception. You could think of the distinction between envelopes and fine structures 
in terms of uh, drawing. The envelope's gonna be thought of as providing the outline of the drawing, whereas uh, the shading details could be thought of as the fine structure information. And another helpful way to visualize the signal being sent to a cochlear implant is the electrodogram. So for those of you who are unfamiliar, a spectrogram, as pictured on the left of this, left of this slide, plots the spectrum of frequencies of a given sound over time. In this case, the spectrum that's plotted is of the speech signal wheel. Wheel. The right figure is an example of an electrodogram, which is similar to a spectrogram, and it plots the current levels of each of the 22 electrodes in a cochlear implant, where each electrode can be thought of as corresponding to a single frequency band in a vocoder. Wheel. Oops. <laughs> so given that CI processing is based on the channel vocoder, Vocoders are actually used quite often in the research field as CI simulations, where listening studies are conducted with uh, subjects with normal hearing. And this has benefits in terms of controlling for factors which are high, highly variable in the CI population, such as duration of deafness, duration of implant use, and level of neurological functioning. And it's also important to mention that these simulations don't necessarily sound exactly like CI devices, but they, but they do uh, give an impression of the level of speech intelligibility that can be achieved with a dramatic reduction in spectral resolution as produced by CI de devices. And studies have demonstrated similar levels of speech intelligibility between CI users and normal hearing listeners using vocoders. And these types of CI simulations typically make use of bandpass noise or sign tones centered on the center frequencies of the filter bank channels. So to provide a visual example of how vocoders can limit, uh, can limit spectral cues, let's take a look at these picture examples. When the number of pixels is limited to a very low resolution, such as the picture on the left, you can't really tell what you're looking at. But as you increase the resolution by adding more pixels, you can start to see the face emerging from the fuzziness. You only need about 20 pixels to know what, who the face belongs to. And now I'll, pl I'll play you some examples of how this might work for speech. First, I'll play you an example of a speech utterance that's processed by a one-channel vocoder. And then the same utterance played by uh, processed by an eight-channel vocoder. This is an example of an eight-channel processor. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Hopefully, you're able to tell the difference in intel intelligibility when more spectral channels were added. <laughs> um, so there are two approaches to designing the filter banks used in these vocoder simulations. The first approach is the IIR filter bank approach, where a bank of fourth order Butterworth IR bandpass filters are used. And these, these uh, filters approximate auditory filters in terms of bandwidth and center frequencies. The envelopes from each band are, of the filtered waveforms are then extracted using low pass filtering and used to modulate the carrier signal. And the obtained waveforms are then summed to generate uh, the final acoustic simulation. The second approach is an FFT-based filter bank, where the FFT of the input signal is calculated and the FFT bins are then combined to form N bands with bandwidths corresponding to those of auditory filters. Using this approach, the primary parameters are the FFT size, which determines the number of spectral bins, and the number of frequency bands, which the FFT bins will be subsequently grouped into. And depending on the specific type of vocoder implementation, the FFT-based approach can be computationally more efficient but it's important to choose an FFT library that's efficient enough for your given application. After taking the FFT of the input signal, the FFT bins need to be grouped together to approximate the bandwidth of auditory filters, since FFT bins are linear spaced, linearly spaced in frequency. And the bark scale can be useful for this kind of mapping. Uh, for those of you who are unfamiliar, the bark scale is a psychoacoustic scale based on subjective measurements in which equal distances along the scale correspond to perceptually equal distances. So for example, if you're going for the from the first to the second bark band, that'd be as big of a change in perceptual pitch as going from the second to the third. And weights can be calculated for the purposes of combining these FFT bins into bark bands. And there's some useful scripts available in, in Python and MATLAB that allow for, these, for the calculation of these weights. So with all that in mind, how do we create a real-time vocoder plugin? For that, I turn to Juice, the Juice framework, which many of us here use. Uh, there's a number of helpful classes which facilitated the development of my plugin. 
For the filter bank, the IIR filter and uh, FFT classes provided really intuitive and easy to use methods. And for the synthesis of the carrier waveform, the synthesizer, synth voice, and synth sound classes were super helpful. I also used the uh, Maximilian library to create oscillators with different waveforms, including square wave, sawtooth, and noise. Now, let's jump into some code. To start, let's take a look at the plugin processor for the vocoder. We're only going to focus on a few of these methods in my talk today, so just these ones at the bottom. But, so starting with the function at the top, the calculate RMS amplitude of block function simply takes, uh, calculates the mean RMS of amplitude of a block of audio samples of size FFT size. The smooth spectrum function takes the average of the signal magnitude as a kind of low-pass filtering operation to, to help extract the envelope of the signal. The get magnitude of interleaved complex array function calculates the magnitude of a complex array such as FFT data. And the function at the bottom simply multiplies uh, the carrier signal by a sinusoidal envelope. If we take a look inside the synth voice class, which is responsible for the synthesis of the carrier waveforms, the most important part of this class is the render next block method, which gets overridden. And it handles the generation of different waveforms using the frequency which it receives from the MIDI note number, as well as start and stop note triggers for driving an ADR, ADSR envelope that's multiplied with the carrier waveform. Instead of showing you the process block of the plugin, I thought it might be more helpful showing just the vocode method itself, which implements the actual processing of the vocoder. First, the FFTs of both the modulator and carrier are calculated, and the magnitude of the modulator is then computed and subsequently smoothed by averaging. The for loop at the bottom loops through the number of filter bands in the vocoder and multiplies the carrier with the smoothed envelope that's extracted from the modulator. So here, here's my current UI for my plugin, which I've named the Cochlear Implant Vocoder. I've got a very simple layout for now, which consists of a, just a waveform selection section with a group of buttons. But I'm planning on adding a drop-down menu so that users can select the number of frequency bands, uh, which is an accessible parameter in the, in the plugin currently. So here's a little demo of speech process through the plugin using 16 channels. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so in summary, uh, after presenting an introduction on how cochlear implants work, I've shared about the design and code behind a, a real-time vocoder with MIDI functionality and parameters for waveform selection and the number of frequency bands. For next steps, I'd like to consider how to simulate other aspects of CI sound coding. In cochlear implants, it's possible to use a technique called current steering, where you can uh, create vir virtual pitch percepts by steering the current between two neighboring electrodes. And I'd like to tr see if I could possibly simulate that using uh, additional weightings with my FFT bark band based filter bank. And lastly, I'd like to consider how to use real-time vocoders such as this one as a way of experimenting with sound design approaches um, in ways of treating cochlear implant processing like a musical instrument. So we could think about how to reverse engineer music that might sound more pleasant to CI users. And with that, I'd like to thank the ADC team and the audience both in person and online my old lab at the Bionic Ear Lab at the University of Southern California for providing me with the opportunity to learn about cochlear implants. And I'd also welcome any questions you might have. Thank you. How fine grained are the uh, bands in, in terms of, is there a limit to the resolution? Great question. Um, different cochlear implants have different numbers of electrode channels. Some, um, some manufacturers have 22 channels, some have 16. So it really depends on the, the physical um, manufacturing of that electrode array. But you can create virtual channels by steering current between two neighboring electrodes. And that's, that's kind of how they like trick the auditory system into having more resolution, better resolution. Yep. So I'm sure you could have done a lot of the work, say, in MATLAB with some simulations, but you yep. developed a real-time tool. Has that felt like you can develop ideas quicker? Like, tell me about that well, real-time yeah, system. I'm glad you mentioned MATLAB because MATLAB is what I use to calculate the bark band weightings. And I actually implemented the whole 
plugin in MATLAB first as like a prototyping environment because there's a really useful class in MATLAB called audio plugin class and you can develop a real-time um, plugin and test it in MATLAB, which is what I did. Uh, so that was super helpful. And then I turned to choose to try to port that to, to uh, C++. Mm -hmm. uh, in terms of evaluating uh, how this would sound to a cochlear implant user, is there something you could do with like headphones and an HRDF to get closer to what they might experience or? Absolutely, and that's what we do with, with uh, listeners with normal hearing, but there's also uh, very interesting use cases with uh, subjects with single-sided deafness who have cochlear implants on one side. So they have effectively normal hearing on the other side and we could bring them into the lab and have them do matching experiments where they can match the vocoder specifically to the cochlear implant. So that's, that's something I've done before and it's super interesting. Hi, Shaikh. Thank you for the talk. Uh, I have a quick question about the cochlear implants. Uh, do they ignore the labyrinth of the pinar to kind of capture the spatial information? Well, it, it, it depends on the manufacturer. Advanced Bionics has a uh, microphone that's placed within the pinna, so it captures the HRTF information to a certain extent. But other, other manufacturers have the behind-the-ear unit, which is positioned above the ear, so they don't capture that HRTF. But even if, it, if they did, it's very... Um, Crude. That information is very crudely uh, represented in cochlear implants. Yeah, thank you. Yeah.